and uh, yeah, as uh, as you as you remind uh, this this the attendees, we can collect your question again also for this second part of the morning. So please, uh, if you have some question, just drop a few lines in the chat, and we will address them later on. Okay, so. We move to the next speaker of the morning. The next speaker of the morning is uh, Federico Casolari. Uh, he is professor of European Union law at the University of Bologna. He is interested in the relationship between the European law and the international law, so within the context of the international law, and also about the general principle of the European law. Uh, I think it's really important to address risk assessments also from a regulatory point of view and to put it in the context of the general European law. So today, uh, Federico Casolari will uh, discuss a little bit or will bring us into the European Green Deal, the farm to fork approach. So Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can uh, hear me, you can see me. And I'd like also to thank all the organizer for uh, having me here today, it's a big pleasure to be part of this faculty and to, to participate in such a terrific summer school. Uh, as has been already said, uh, the idea uh, of my intervention is to give you uh, a general overview of the strategy the European Union has elaborated recently in 2020 in order to deal with uh, 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 food sustainability in a larger context, so also in the light of universal dimension. Uh, I'm perfectly aware that lawyers may uh, become boring. Uh, that's why uh, I will try not to be too technical. I will try only to, to, to give you a, a general picture of the legal framework uh, by stressing some points that to me are particularly uh, relevant. So, uh, let me just try to okay okay um yeah uh let's say uh, uh the basic assumption the starting assumption of every reasoning on strategies on food sustainability is represented by the need to combine two different needs on the one hand we have to deal i mean societies governments, international organizations have to deal with uh, the hunger challenge. On the other hand, we have to take into consideration the earth capacities. So there is a, uh, a growing uh, a need to try to combine these two different needs. How the idea was to try to consider them uh, in a holistic uh approach uh, by elaborating holistic strategies um, uh, by using the prism the perspective of a principle of sustainable development the principle of sustainable development is a principle which has been elaborated in international environmental law since the 90s of last century trying to combine the protection of environment with other uh, needs uh, such as uh, the, the protection of respect of democracy, uh, the uh, uh, intergenerational equity, and the protection of human rights. And in doing that, in particular, we have to take into consideration that today it is, let's say, uh, well acknowledged at the international level that there is a right to food a right to adequate food that shall be recognized to every human being. So this is a general international law rule, which is today recognized worldwide. There are also instruments uh, codifying so, such right. And this right, of course, shall be uh, interpreted and implemented by taking into consideration the principle of sustainable development. So this is a very general basic assumption of our uh, journey. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation. So first of all, I, I would like to, to give you uh, some elements which are related to the universal framework, meaning the United Nations one. So I, I will uh, speak a little bit about 
uh, the sustainable development goals, which are related to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, topic we are discussing here. And, and after that, uh, I will give you some general information on the approach which has been elaborated by the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is the UN organization, let's say, uh, in charge of uh, elaborating a cooperation among states in, in, those, in those areas. After that, we will uh, take into consideration more deeply uh, the approach which has been elaborated by the European Union uh, recently, and I will try to, let's say, on the one hand, uh, stress, let's say, the coherence the EU approach has uh, uh, put in place with regard to the universal. Uh, and at the end, some general conclusions on, on what we will uh, see. So starting from the UN uh, framework, Okay, uh, very important, the development uh, of the, the elaboration of the so-called sustainable and development goals, in particular, maybe I have skipped, uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> a slide, uh, in particular, uh, uh, the zero hunger challenge. Uh, the sustainable development goals are the result of, uh, let's say, a process which uh, uh, started in 2012 uh, in the Rio Plus conference, which was um, convened by the United Nations in order to try to face the problem of food security and nutrition and sustainable development. Uh, and after, uh, let's say, some, some uh, uh, work, uh, which was uh, uh, put in place by UN agencies and also international organizations involved in that, in that uh, framework, uh, uh, the United Nations elaborated the Sustainable Development Goals, among which we have a specific goal which is dedicated to uh, the fight against hunger. So the idea that every uh, you know, human beings in the world shall have access to an adequate uh, 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 level amount of, of food, also considering, of course, cultural and regional requirements and cultural and re religious requirements that may uh, be, uh, be relevant. So, uh, 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 an important point in this respect that uh, must be stressed is that the Sustainable Development Goals elaborated at UN level does not uh, represent binding instruments, meaning that uh, they do not represent binding commitments for the member states of the United Nations and, uh, and other international organizations. They represent uh, objectives that must be incorporated into uh, all the policies implemented by states by regional international organizations and other actors that are involved in developing uh, agricultural policies, agricultural cooperation and the protection of environment. So this is a very important point. We are not speaking here about obligations, but about objectives that must be incorporated into strategies and into national policies, okay? This is why it's important taking into consideration this, uh, this point, it's important to give a look at the strategies that have been elaborated by the most relevant actors worldwide in order to incorporate this, uh, this goal. And I would like now to, to go uh, straight to uh, the uh, uh, strategy, the approach elaborated by the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2014, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization adopted an approach, a common vision for sustainable food and agriculture, which is based on five key uh, pillars or principles, combining uh, uh, the right to, to food with the need to protect the environment, to sustain the economies of, mem of, of the states concerned, and uh, to respect the human rights of 
uh, people concerned. So as you can see, uh, these uh, key principles are the uh, improvement of efficiency in the use of resources, because resources are limited, they are not endless, as we know. The conservation, the protection and the enhancement of natural ecosystems, the protection of improvement of rural livelihoods and social well-being, the enhancement of resilience of people, of communities and ecosystems. Here, there is also uh, emphasis on the need to protect people and the, uh, the environment and ecosystems from disasters, natural disasters and man-made disasters. As you know, also due to the climate change uh, uh, challenge, uh, natural disasters are more and more occurring. And that's why uh, uh, there is a, a need to, to incorporate strategies into uh, general policies of international organizations and international actors to try to manage disaster situations. So also that dimension is quite, it's quite relevant. And last but not least, the promotion of a good governance of natural and human systems. The idea, again, we are not speaking about binding commitments, okay? So first we have sustainable development goals, which are not binding. They are incorporated here into a strategy elaborated by the Food and Agriculture Organization. And again, this strategy is not binding per se. So in order to become binding, in order to impose obligations, the, the strategy must be implemented in particular by the member states of the organization. So the member states have to elaborate legislation, pieces of legislation in order to incorporate that approach into their legal system. So in other words, it's a, a, a sort of, let's say, uh, a mechanism uh, which is uh, based on uh, a national enforcement. And this is probably uh, the most relevant, uh, let's say, uh, uh, problem we have with the strategies elaborated at universal level. They are consistent, they are well structured, but they are lacking of uh, enforcement mechanisms because uh, only member states uh, may adopt binding instruments that are, let's say, binding only within the territory of your member states. So there is also a risk of fragmentation and a risk of incoherence in the different ways states may implement uh, the, that strategy. A last point I would like to uh, stress in, in the strategy elaborated by the Food and Agriculture Organization as the fact that according to, let's say, uh, the approach of the organization, agriculture, the agriculture is, let's say, uh, a sort of interface between uh, uh, two words, okay? Uh, the natural system and the human and the human, and the human system. So it represents a sort of, let's say, uh, uh, intersection among the two, and it has to take into consideration the needs uh, emerging from the two different words. So with this in mind, we can now move to the U dimension, uh, and in particular to uh, uh, the Farm to Fork strategy elaborated, as I told you, in May 2020. Uh, the strategy is part of a, a larger uh, a strategy elaborated by the Union, the so-called Green Deal. The, uh, the Green Deal was launched by uh, the European Commission, by the President of the European Commission, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen. And the idea was to make uh, Europe neutral, a neutral continent by 2050. So basically, uh, the strategy is based on the same assumptions and it incorporates the same logic we have seen in the case of the food and agriculture organization. So there is the need to uh, elaborate uh, mechanisms and uh, policies to reach the goal which is uh, posed by the UN, uh, the zero hunger challenge, 
At the same time, they need to, to do it in a sustainable way. So basically, uh, the idea is always the same. What it is different here is the context, which makes stronger and more enforceable the action put in place by the European Union. There are two elements that must be taken into consideration in this respect. First, according to EU law, so if we look at EU law, in particular, if you look at EU primary law, meaning if you consider the treaties, the founding treaties, the need to protect uh, 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 the environment, uh, as well as the need to protect uh, human health and the health of all the other living uh, uh, entities and bodies represent do represent a cross-cutting issues in all the EU policies, meaning that these two needs shall be taken into consideration by the EU legislature, by the EU institutions in every single strand of action. Also in, in the context of consumer protection, transport, policy, uh, or I don't know, uh, um, criminal uh, cooperation. In all the policies of you, the institutions has to take into consideration these two needs. So these already represent a strong platform in order to make uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, 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 enforceable uh, the content of uh, the front fork strategy. On the other hand, there is another element that must be stressed, which is represented by the fact that the European Union may adopt binding instruments. And we have already seen in the presentations of the first part of this morning that actually the EU has adopted during the time regulations and other pieces of legislation. So it's possible for the Union to uh, elaborate obligations for the member states and other EU actors. So it's possible, in other words, to incorporate the objectives in binding tools, in binding instruments. And this is not possible, as we have seen in the case of EU, I mean, generally speaking, of course, in the case of universal organization. So this is a very added value of EU, of EU action. And you have also to consider that EU, EU law uh, enjoys a primacy of national law, meaning that EU law uh, may prevail over the legislation of member states. So it's also possible to ensure a coherence at EU level in the different member states. And these, uh, let's say, uh, downsides the possibility of fragmentation in the implementation of you uh, of you policies and of the farm to fork strategy so there are huge differences with uh, 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 regard to what we have seen in the case of food and agriculture organization uh, the uh, farm to fork strategy as the, uh, uh, the uh, FAO one is based on pillars uh, here in this slide, you have the list of the pillars identified in the strategy. Again, more or less, they are the same. We have already seen ensuring sustainable food production, ensuring, of course, food security, uh, stimulating sustainable food processing, wholesale, retail, hospitality, and food services practices promoting sustainable food consumption and facilitating the shift to healthy, sustainable diets, reducing food loss and waste, and combating food fraud uh, along the food supply chain. So there are some, uh, let's say, differences in the sense that there are some elements related also to uh, criminal cooperation, for instance. This is due to the fact that the Union has a larger mandate than the Food and Agriculture Organization, but more or less, as you can see, the logic is the same. The big difference is given by, uh, uh, let's say, the tools the, the European Union may uh, put at disposal in this respect. And coming to the end of the presentation, uh, let me stress another point, which is quite relevant. Um, of course, uh, what I said so far 
regarding the EU action uh, is related to its internal dimension, meaning that it is related to uh, the obligations that the EU institutions may adopt uh, and may impose upon member states, the member states of the European Union. But we have also to take into consideration that the European Union may play a global uh, role, may, may, may uh, uh, let's say, act as a global actor. So may also contribute to elaborate general standards that may be applied also by other international actors, other international organizations and third countries. And uh, particularly relevant in this respect is the trade policy, the common commercial policy. So the possibility for the union to enter into agreements with third countries or other international organizations in order to facilitate uh, the cooperation in the trade domain. In this respect, the Union may introduce conditionality mechanisms in order to make sure that uh, its, let's say, goals, its objectives may be also, uh, let's say, pursued at international level. So, this is another element we have to consider. This is also an external projection of a strategy. It, it is not only focused on the internal, let's say, dimension of the European Union. And the EU is becoming more and more active as a global player also in that respect. So to conclude, uh, we have seen that at universal level and also regional level, uh, the idea in order to combine uh, uh, the fight against hunger and the protection of environment is represented today by the elaboration of holistic strategies based on uh, the principle of sustainable development. The most relevant problem we have at universal level is the lack of enforcement tools, enforcement mechanisms. Which, which is also a general problem we have when it comes to international law. Uh, it's uh, particularly difficult to identify mechanisms that may be put in place in order to force states and actors to respect obligations assumed at international level. At EU level, this problem is, let's say, uh, solved in the sense that the union has been created as something different from other international organizations with a, a strong decision-making power. So the union may elaborate uh, uh, obligations, binding instruments uh, uh, that, uh, let's say, are giving shape to uh, the objectives of uh, the strategy, and at the same time may contribute to uh, the uh, elaboration of global standards by acting on the international scene uh, as a global player. Uh, this is the state of the art. And in these very uh, last days, uh, a new, let's say, uh, a possibility, uh, uh, a new uh, uh, event has been launched, uh, the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, which took place last, last week. Uh, the idea is again to try to find common solutions worldwide concerning uh, the, the global agenda of food sustainability. The main problem again, it's too, uh, of course, it's too, uh, uh, let's say, soon to make uh, a, a final assessment of this exercise. So we'll see in the next weeks, maybe in the next months, uh, let's say, the results of this exercise. But it seems to me that, again, the idea is to try to elaborate general strategies without introducing commitments for states and other actors. So again, a lack of enforcement, which represents a major challenge the United Nations of the universal uh, uh, context should take into consideration sooner or later. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Federico, for your really interesting and in-depth presentation of the international context.